Welcome to uh, Wednesday Night in the Word tonight. I am Pastor Rick, and uh, just trying to get myself situated here. Uh, okay, there we go. I think I'm all set. Anyway, yeah, good evening, everyone. Good to see you on here. Uh, it's so good to see some people signing on. 16 people so far. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, greet you in the name of Jesus. I greet you in the name of Jesus today. And uh, let me take a minute to say hello real quick to everyone. James Carter. Uh, hey, James. Uh, Sandy Whitney. I when I, I saw your note earlier, Sandy, and it brought a smile to my face. Uh, but I know exactly what you mean, and it's good to get into the Word. Absolutely. Tony, God bless you, my friend. Danica, Angela, down in Worcester. Uh, Anita, God bless you, Anita. <clears throat> hey, Dolores, good to see you. Lorinda and Sandy are here. Good to see you guys back on here. Jerry Ellis down in Thompson, Connecticut. Hey, Jerry and Jeannie Ellis. Uh, so good to see you on here. Uh, we'll be uh, ordering some uh, hoodies uh, pretty soon, so we'll keep you in mind for that. Pauline Gagnon, God bless you. Doreen, uh, Doreen, you were so on my mind today. I almost sent you a text and I got sidetracked, but I was definitely thinking about you and Billy. Good to see you on here tonight. Pastor Bill, good to see you. Uh... So James says, Pastor Rico Armadillo. Well, Pastor Rico's okay, but the last part, I don't know about that. And my lovely wife, Pamela. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, if you hit your share button, uh, we may pick up a few extra people. Uh, but anyway, we've been averaging around 20 or so. Um, I was I'm always hoping for 30, but anyway, I'm glad, I'm glad for one. <laughs> um, so anyway, why don't we uh, take a minute and open up with a word of prayer and uh, have a few quick announcements and then um, we'll get into the word tonight. We'll be in Daniel chapter 2. All right, let's pray. Can we, can we do that? Let's go to the Lord. Lord God, we thank you for this day. Um, Lord, as we see the, the weather changing and the, the, the darkness coming earlier, um, we're reminded, Lord, that you, you hold earth in your hands and you, you allow the days and nights, you allow the sun and the moon to, to rise and set and you give us breath every single day and we thank you and praise you for that. Uh, Lord, it's good to know that we know the God of the universe as well as the God of the individual. And Father, I just want to pray your blessing over tonight's service. Uh, let everything we say and do bring glory to you and and edification to the body of Christ. We pray, Lord, that we'll really be able to focus tonight and get into your word and get into what you want to, want to speak to us about. <clears throat> and I pray, Lord, for any, any personal needs that are out there, Lord, that you would meet those needs in a special way. Lord, we do want to pray for the Feldmans, Gary and Joanne. I want to pray for Sandy Whitney. I want to pray for Alinda uh, de La Hoya. I want to pray for Diane Rossetti. I want to pray for Eva Rogers and... Uh, Lift up Angela as well. And Lord, anyone else, uh, Jerry and Jean Ellis that have been struggling with COVID, for Marilyn, our dear sister Marilyn that we just found out has COVID, uh, for Bill and Edna Unger that are recovering, uh, recovering from um, COVID, and uh, their son, um, Phil and his wife, um, just recovering from, from uh, COVID. So Lord, bring your healing, bring your touch, bring your life to us. We give you thanks and praise, and we surrender this time to you and pray for your perfect will to be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All righty. Hey, Millie Merced, good to see you. Alinda, hello there. Hey, Rob LaFountain, good to see you. Uh, pray for Stacy. Yeah, stacy has been having some really bad headaches, and I thought of another prayer request too that I, I just wanted to mention. Let, let's go to the Lord one more time. Father, we pray for Stacy tonight, uh, dealing with headaches, probably associated with Lyme disease and, and associated issues. In the name of Jesus, Lord, bless her, heal her, strengthen her. Uh, let her be delivered from this pain. Let her sleep well tonight in the name and authority of Jesus. And Lord, also for our young man uh, that we heard about um, that, uh, that uh, attempted a suicide uh, situation, we just pray, Lord, for, for healing, uh, physically healing, emotionally, but mostly, Lord, healing spiritually for this person in the name and authority of Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for being there for, for these people. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. 
Amen and amen. All right. Okay, so I um, wanted to mention a few things here before we get into the Word. Um, tomorrow night is a, is a men's Zoom meeting, Brotherhood Zoom meeting with Pastor Wayne. Uh, Saturday is the men's breakfast at 8 o'clock. Uh, the Zoom meeting tomorrow is at 7. All men are invited to come, encouraged to come. Ladies, encourage your men to get on the Zoom meeting tomorrow night, uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, Friday, November the 5th, is the mission celebration night at the church at 6.30. Uh, we'll have a couple of missionaries speak to us, a time of worship. So it'll be a great time of fellowship. So come on out, make plans on uh, November the 5th. The following Friday is November the 12th, and that will be the next sisterhood meeting at 6.30. I um, wanted to thank everyone for uh, buying a lot of t-shirts and hoodies and stuff on Sunday. We raised uh, almost $300 for missions. Uh, so there are some things left. We'll have them available on Sunday. Uh, I wanted to read to you the email I sent out yesterday. Uh, if you didn't get the email, um, or you're not on our email list, please give me your email address. I'll make sure you get it. But I wanted to read this to you uh, just so that everyone knows where we are at this point. So, uh, hi, New Life. Uh, God is definitely good. Uh, remember the plan to either be in church or online each Sunday morning till the end of the year? Well, we're off to a great start. Hallelujah. We're very thankful for the nearly 140 people that were involved in Sunday service. Uh, God was in the house. Please spread the word and invite others to join you as we proceed to the end of the year. Remember, as Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile his body with the foreign king's delicacies, Daniel 1.8, we too must make tough decisions that will honor the Lord. So now there are nine Sundays left in 2021. Can we all decide to make church a high priority until December 26th, the last Sunday of 21? Come on, we must, and we can. Blessings follow as we put God first, Matthew 6.33. And $295 was raised for missions last Sunday via the donations received for the New Life t-shirts and hoodies. Thank you for taking advantage of this opportunity. There are still items left, so come prepare this Sunday to receive your merchandise. Please be aware, uh, we will be ordering more New Life hoodies soon. We will keep you posted on that. This is the part I want you, wanted you to get right here. This Sunday is October 31st. The, the world will be celebrating Halloween. We, however, will be celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ, his atoning work on Calvary, and his glorious resurrection from the dead. This Sunday, as we thwart the works of the devil and remind principalities and powers of darkness that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be partaking of communion, Please come ready to proclaim Jesus as Lord over your lives, over your homes, over your children, over your finances. Remember 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in you, that's Jesus, than he that is in the world, that's the devil. These are exciting days indeed. God is doing a new thing at New Life. Make plans now to be here, and if possible, bring someone with you. All for Jesus, Pastor Rick and Pamela. And then I ended with a scripture, Colossians 2. 13 through 15, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Hallelujah. So that was uh, this week's email. And I uh, just wanted to encourage everyone. This Sunday, uh, it's the last Sunday of the month, but we will be having communion because we want to just make a statement um, to the world around us, including the spiritual world, that we serve a risen Savior that has conquered uh, the works of Satan. Uh, and then the following Sunday will be November, November the 7th, I believe. Uh, we will be having communion that day as well. All right, let's get into the Word. Can we do that? Um, we are in Daniel chapter 2. And, uh, you know, I said something on Sunday 
and I want to just uh, mention it again. I, I was talking about the live streams and how, how important it is to, you know, to really get into what we're talking about. Hey, Gene Eaton, good to see you. Um, you know, I, I was saying, you know, you can't really, you know, do other things and, and watch the live stream and get a whole lot out of it. But I heard a, <coughs> heard a statement the other day. <clears throat> I was at a conference um, in Shrewsbury, and uh, someone had told me that most statistically, uh, a one-hour live stream uh, is viewed for 19 minutes by on the average per individual. So out of 60 minutes, 19 of those minutes are focused, and the rest of the time, you know, that would be an extra what 40, 39 minutes or so. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Or 41 minutes, but that that would be that's a tough that's a tough statistic for to take, you know. So if we could if we could stay focused, um, I remember I watched a few live streams when I was visiting my mom down in New York, and I really enjoyed the uh, the Sunday morning live stream. But I didn't have any distractions. I had a cup of coffee in front of me and my Bible, and I just stayed glued to the whole thing, and I really really enjoyed it. So if you can. I know some people, you may have to clean up or do the, you may have to literally do the dishes, but um, keep, a, keep an ear open to what we're saying. Um, so anyway, Jerry Ellis, what are you saying here? I don't agree. Um, oh, what, people on the average t spend 19 minutes out of an hour? That's a, a statistic someone came up with. I don't know where they got it from, but uh, that's what uh, that's what I heard. I know that you and Jeannie, uh, yeah, and Jerry, I appreciate it. I know you you put you put the uh, live stream on your large screen TV set, and uh, you get into it. I know you do because you're always engaging, and I I, I really do appreciate that. But I, I, the statistics I heard was on the whole. Uh, so there there will be some that get into it the whole time. Others. Whatever, you know, they kind of walk around and do whatever they have to do. Angela, good. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Now, I don't know who does and who doesn't, you know, because I'm just over here all by myself. I don't know what's going on at home for everybody. Uh, I'm glad we have 20 people, praise the Lord. Um, I'm just trying to encourage everyone to kind of get plugged in uh, if you're not. And, then, you know, feel free to make comments. Yeah, I did say that, you know. Oh, well, it makes sense to me, but I don't know. Maybe some people are, can multitask. I'm not really sure. But I, I better get into the Word before I get myself in trouble. <laughs> well, that's good, Jerry. Thank you. All right, so Daniel chapter 2. Uh, the thing about Daniel is, since we started the study of Daniel, I, I've heard two different messages from two different pastors, one locally and uh, one was at the conference I was at. Uh, speaking about this book of Daniel in a similar way that I have been. And we didn't talk to each other beforehand. <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, Daniel is a great book, a lot of meat in it. I, I, I originally, you know, I think the Lord laid it on my heart because we ended Romans uh, by saying that the Lord is able to uh, sustain us and grow us by the prophetic word. That was one of the things. And so I, I was thinking, well, we should go to a, a prophetic book, which is the book of Daniel. But there's so much other information uh, in the book of Daniel in addition to the prophecies. Like, like I was saying Sunday, how did Daniel get to be the way he was just as a person with character and integrity? And uh, we talked about how, you know, it doesn't say, but obviously he was brought up in a godly home and a godly culture. Uh, he was not about to defile his, his body with the king's food. That was against the, the rule, so to speak. Hey, Millie Cobbett, good to see you here tonight. Let me just check this out. Uh, James Carter, we put on the big screen, shut the lights off and sit down. And James, that is wonderful. That's great. That's great. Uh, no, Sandy, you know, if you got to cook dinner for your, your husband, I mean, you know, that, that probably is a priority. Uh, because you have to, you have to take care of your family. So that that's uh, that's understandable. I think what I what I was what what the person was referring to when they told me that that figure was people will turn on the live stream and just leave, 
<laughs> you know, so their number is on, but they're not on in, in real life. But I, I'm just saying, and I just want everyone to get as much out of this as you can. Uh, hey, Millie, I'm glad you joined us tonight, Millie Cobbett. Okay, so we're in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, just real quickly here. So Daniel, uh, Daniel's part of the king's entourage. Um, he's, he's considered a, a wise man or a magi. Uh, he's associating with the uh, astrologers, the magicians. Uh, even the soothsayers are involved here. Um, and uh, so he, he's one of the people that the king turned to to not only interpret the king's dream, but to tell him what the dream was. And uh, everyone was saying, we can't, we, how can we tell you what the dream was? We could tell you the interpretation once we hear the dream, the dream but uh, how, do I, how do we know what the dream was in the first place? Uh, <laughs> Millie, uh, that's a question you'll have to ask James Carter or, or uh, Jerry Ellis. Uh, hey, that's great. Dor See that? I'm glad I, you know what? I appreciate everyone getting back to me on that. That's really, really good. I, I still appreciate that. So important. Hey, Bill and Edna Unger, we just prayed for you. Uh, glad you could join us tonight. Hope you're all feeling better out there. We prayed for Philip as well. So, uh, so the king has a dream. He wants someone to tell him what the dream was so that he knows that the, whoever's interpreting it is not making something up. And that's an impossible task. But anyway, Daniel catches wind of that. Uh, he says in verse number 17, I'm sorry, verse number 16, Daniel 2.16, Daniel goes to the king and says, Listen, king, give me some time. Give me some time, and I'll get the, interpre I'll get the dream and the interpretation for you, but give me some time. So Daniel goes back with his comrades, and uh, they pray, they seek the Lord. Uh, verse number 17 and 18, they, they sought the mercies from, from the God of heaven concerning this secret, and uh, they, they just ran after God. Verse number 19 says, The secret was revealed. And uh, in a night vision, so Daniel, instead of running to the king or running to Arioch, who's the king's uh, steward or helper, <clears throat> he and the, the, I think he and the, his three buddies uh, begin to bless the Lord and to thank the Lord. So verses 20 to 23 are Daniel's prayer. And we went all through that last week. But the point of the prayer was that he's praising God. He's praising God. The name of the Lord, we get into the different names of God, praising the Lord for wisdom, for knowledge. Uh, he knows the secrets uh, in men's hearts. He knows, he knows the times and the seasons. He raises up kings and puts down kings. Uh, he, reveals, uh, he reveals deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness, light dwells in him. So he's just praising God. There's no request in the prayer. It's just a prayer of thanksgiving, which is a wonderful thing to do, uh, you know, often. Just to thank God, find something to thank God for and, and thank Him. Uh, and then we got into verse 24 just a little bit. So I'm going to start reading verse 24. And uh, I call this the prelude before the dream. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, because they couldn't tell the king what the dream was. He went in and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Well, he'll also tell him what the dream was. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. So the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, that was his new name, right? That's his new name, his, his Babylonian name. Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel says in verse 27, uh, answering in the presence of the king, he, he said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. <laughs> so Daniel agreed. It's impossible for someone with just natural ability to tell you what your dream was. That's impossible. But verse 28, great verse, but... There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your, of your, he, of your head upon your bed were these. 
So now, verse 29, he starts to get into it a little bit. But he says, as for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed. So he was dozing off, sleeping, had, had a dream about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. So Daniel just flipped that whole thing. And he said, I can't even tell you what the dream was. God gave this dream to you, you know, so that you would know what's going to happen in the latter days. We'll get into that. Verse 30, but as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. Note the humility of our dear brother Daniel. I mean, if that was today, man, he'd be writing a book and would sell a million copies. He'd be, he'd be a millionaire based on the book that he wrote about this revelation. He said, look, I don't have any more wisdom than anybody else. I, I, don't, I didn't get this thing because I have wisdom. Um, but this has been revealed, verse 30, for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king. I think maybe he's saying... This interpretation was made known to us so that you don't kill us. Remember, he was going to kill everybody, all the, all the wise men who couldn't give him the dream of the interpretation. And, and also, verse 30, that you, king, may know the thoughts of your heart. So the revelation, according to Daniel, came so that the king would know what was in his heart. And man, oh man, what was in his heart is, is pretty astounding. Hey, Roseanne, God bless you. Uh, so anyway, so verse number 31 begins the, the, uh, the dream interpretation. Now, I don't know if anybody out there is familiar with this dream and its interpretation, but I just want to say something. Who in the world is King Nebuchadnezzar to get a revelation from God like that, that pertains to, and we'll see what this pertains to, it, it pertains to kingdoms. Uh, throughout all of history, from the time of King Nebuchadnezzar until the, the return of Jesus Christ way at the end of time, after the thousand-year reign. Who is this king that God would give him a dream that then Daniel would know what the dream was supernaturally and then be able to interpret it? But I, I'm just astounded that, you know, why didn't Daniel get the dream? It seems like, you know, Daniel would have been a good choice to get the dream. Or, or one of his three buddies, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were good young Hebrew men. They loved God. They were sold out to God. They were not defiling their bodies, etc., etc. But the Lord chose an ungodly, pagan, heathen king to give him a dream that pertains to to all of history. And I just think that that's pretty astounding. The point is, God does whatever he wants. You, you could say, you know, you could say, you know, God, you know, will only do things for people that are just almost perfect, you know. But I don't see that. In, in, in fact, now, now that I say that, who in the Bible, great men and women, did not have sin. Some had some outrageous sin in their lives, including Moses, including David, you know, including uh, uh, Peter and, and Paul even, you know, when persecuting the, the Christians. So although you can never say that, well, then I'm not going to try to be good and be holy and be righteous and chase after God. You can't do that either. But you can't look at it as, well, God's going to reward me with something supernatural. I mean, we serve God because we want to be obedient, not because we want to get something from God. And that's a very important lesson. But in any case, I just thought it was worth mentioning, King Nebuchadnezzar was not a follower of God. He was not a Jew. He was a Babylonian. And isn't it ironic that God used this King Nebuchadnezzar to attack Israel, chapter 1, verse 1, to, to uh, what's the word he uses? ransack or besiege Jerusalem and, and steal away the young men and a lot of children and, all, and really captured all of the Israelites and brought them, you know, from, from Israel to Babylon for 70 years, captivity. And, uh, and gives this guy, who was so mean to Israel, 
this dream about the world and world events. But on the other hand, God, uh, remember why, why Daniel was written in the first place, to remind Israel that although they were disobedient and obnoxious to God, uh, God still loved them. God still had a plan for them. The Messiah was still going to come through them. And uh, so God used Nebuchadnezzar to make that happen. So Nebuchadnezzar was an ungodly man that God used to discipline Israel. I just think that that's pretty cool how God does things. So, um, all right. Uh, God help the more weaker ones. He does help the weaker ones. He does. He really does. Um, I think uh, I think we have to think about who is uh, serving God in that category. If someone's serving God and is weaker, he will definitely help them. And and First Corinthians what thirteen I think it is, or twelve rather, uh, tells us to honor the weaker vessels among us. Uh, but. Um, he, he could use anyone. He, in fact, Paul says the Lord has chosen the weaker things of the world to confound the wise. So there's a whole thing about that. Anyway, I uh, just wanted to say that. So, okay, verse 31 is when the, the dream begins. Oh, I forgot my little, my little drawing. I have to make another one. Remember that drawing I had last week? Well, I'm going to make another one right now because I left that one at home. Wait, did I? Yep, I sure did. All right, so verse 31 begins. O king, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. Verse 31. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. So I googled uh, the image of Daniel's dream in Daniel chapter 2. I googled it, and I, I came across this website, and there was a picture of a soldier um, it, it was a soldier with, with all, all dressed up in his military stuff and uh, looking, you know, strong and mighty. And so the image was a person. Okay, the image was a person. We'll see that. So uh, I'm going to, okay. I, I, and it was a, a beautifully designed person. Uh, the, the splendor was excellent. Uh, the form was awesome. And the head, in verse 32, was of fine gold. So I'm going to make a person's head. That's a person's head. And that's of gold. Okay? Uh, its head was of fine gold. Its chest and arms were of silver. Okay, now I, I, you know I'm not the artist, but... So his chest and arms were of silver. See that? Got gold and silver. All right. Now, <laughs> verse 32. Uh, it's belly and thighs of bronze. So we've got to do that now. See, if Pamela was here, she could really do it good. Okay, so there's the... All right, so verse 32. It's, uh, its belly and thighs were bronze. Belly and thighs. How's that? Get the picture? <laughs> All right. Artist, I'm not. However, I think you get the idea. So the head is gold, the chest and arms are silver, the belly and the thighs are bronze. Note that the top is like the most valuable, right? Gold. It's like the Olympics. Who wins the gold? Who wins the silver? Who wins the bronze? First, second, and third place. But we're getting less valuable as we go down the list here. So gold, silver, and bronze. That's verse 32. Verse 33, it's legs of iron. Legs of iron. See that? Iron. 
So this is the image that the king had. He just had an image of this person. And uh, let's see, that's verse 32. Uh, legs of iron, his feet partly iron and partly of clay. So his feet are iron and clay. I'll just put... Uh, So there you go. That's feet of iron and clay. So there you have the, the figure, right? So that's uh, uh, feet, feet partly of iron, partly of clay. Verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands. So over here, there's a stone. Ta-da, the stone. A white stone, uh, uh, let's go. you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet and iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. Hello, Rick Lehman. Hello, Lisa Nato. Good to see you. Uh, so let's, let's, let's think about that. The legs always go out. What do you mean? Oh, I don't know. I'm not an artist. So, okay, so verse 35. Uh, the, the, the iron, I'm sorry. Yeah, the iron, the clay, the bronze, and the silver, the gold were all crushed together, became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. So remember the threshing floors when they would bring in the wheat and thresh it? They'd strip it and grind it up. And all the little particles would fall to the floor. But this rock crushed everything and made it like really fine, uh, fine, whatever. And it fell on the floor. And then the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. In other words, it destroyed it. So uh, the, the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So this little stone crushed the feet and then it crushed the iron and the bronze and the silver and the gold. And this stone in the, image, in the, in the king's dream became humongous, and the stone covered the whole earth. And so the king, you know, woke up and he said, what in the world was that all about? And that's when the whole trouble started, when he wanted someone to tell him not only the interpretation of the dream, but what the dream was in the first place. Uh, so, all right. <laughs> Pamela says, this looks better than last time. Well, that tells you about where I'm at, you know. So this is King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he had an image of a, of a, a person, um, a great image, look, looked a lot better than this, but the head was gold, the chest and, and arms were made of silver, the belly and thighs were made of bronze, the legs were made of iron, and the feet were made of a combination of iron and clay. And the stone was next to it, and the stone came out of a mountain somehow, and the stone crushed the feet, then it crushed the iron and the bronze and the silver and the head uh, and the gold. And that whole figure was destroyed and wiped out. And the stone enlarged and covered the whole earth. Hey, Christine Mitnick, good to see you here. All right, so that's the dream. And now, let's see, verse number 36 says, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. So, man, well, let me say something else about old Daniel. Dan, in verse 30, 24, Daniel went to Arioch, uh, who was in charge of killing the wise men because no one could tell him what the dream was. But notice how confident Daniel was. He went to Arioch and he said, look, don't kill anybody else. I got the, I got the dream and the interpretation. I just want to say... Sometimes it's really important to know that you know that you know that God has spoken uh, and, and, and you're filled with the Spirit of God and you know what you have to do. Daniel was a courageous young man and um, he, was just, he just knew that he had heard from God. And I really appreciate that about Daniel. All right, so anyway, so verse 36, this is the dream. Now we'll tell you the interpretation. 
before the dream, uh, before the king. Okay, verse 37, where are my notes? I don't want to get too far from my notes because this is crucial right here. Uh, verse 37, you, and 38, so 37 and 38, you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Think about that. This is not a godly man, this King Nebuchadnezzar. This is an ungodly man that God is using to discipline Israel by taking them captive for 70 years and stealing their children away like Daniel and trying to convert them to Babylonianism instead of Judaism. But uh, Daniel says, you king, you're a king of kings. The God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. That's very true. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beast of the field, or the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Wow. So Daniel's saying, okay, King Nebuchadnezzar, you're the big shot. You're, you're the one God picked here. God has anointed you and blessed you, and everything is subject to you. And anyway, uh, the gold represents the Babylonian Empire. I'm going to write that down. Ta-da! So that's the Babylonian Empire. Now let's go through this. I'm going to give you some time frames in a, in a few minutes. Then verse number 30, 39 says, After you, oh, after you, after your reign, O King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, after you shall arise another king, an another kingdom, sorry, inferior to yours. So another king will arise, represented by the next one in line, which is the silver and uh, the silver chest and silver arms, and that kingdom or that empire is identified as the Medo-Persian Empire. I'm going to write it down. So note, okay, the Medo-Persian Empire. Note the two arms are representative of these two people groups, the Medes and the Persians, got together to, to establish this empire. It, this is all true, by the way. This happened in real history. You could check it out. But the Medo-Persian Empire defeated the Babylonian Empire. I'll give you dates later, but we're, we're just going from the top to the next one. Okay? And then in verse number uh, 30... Okay. Verse number... 39, it says, another, after you shall rise another kingdom inferior, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Okay, the third kingdom is represented by the bronze. And that third kingdom is the Grecian Empire, headed by the one and only Alexander the Great. So you have three empires here. This is, this is the king's dream. There's one empire, the Babylonian, that's represented by gold. Then silver represents the Medo-Persian empire. Then the bronze on the belly and thighs represents the Grecian empire, headed by Alexander the Great. Okay, and then so the work to uh, 39, right? 39. Then verse 40, then a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. The fourth kingdom are the legs. But the fourth kingdom gets a little tricky. But I'm going to write down what that is. The fourth kingdom is the Roman Empire. Okay, so here we go. We got the Babylonian Empire. We got the Medo-Persian Empire. We have the Grecian Empire, and we have the Roman Empire, and they're all represented by, by metals, by gold, silver, bronze, and iron. All right, you see that? 
And the Roman Empire uh, also has two legs. Uh, and that's because the Roman Empire was actually divided into the Western Roman Empire, where the capital was Rome, and the Eastern Roman Empire, where the capital was Constantinople. So that's why there's two legs, just like there's two arms up there for Medo Persian, there's the East and West Roman Empire. Okay, so you have Rome and Constantinople in there. So, okay, so now. Uh, Notice also the metal, the, the metals start uh, being valuable and, and precious and glorious, like gold is like the top of the line, gold, silver, bronze, and iron. However, uh, as they go down the list, where am I here? Okay, from the gold to the silver to the bronze to the iron, the last one, the iron, is actually a stronger metal than the bronze or silver or gold. Uh, so... Um, they, they, they're less valuable, but they're stronger in, in, their, in their makeup, in their constitution. And that, that's significant. Uh, so, <clears throat> okay, so then, then we have verses 41, 42, and 43. Now, now this is a little confusing, but I'm going to try my best to, to iron this out. The feet are actually a part of the Roman Empire. But the feet, as you may remember are made up of iron and clay. So clay has been introduced to the iron. The clay doesn't go up the legs, it's just on the feet. So something happened to the Roman Empire to make it a little bit different than it was in the first place. So the feet are characterized by iron and clay. And uh, just wanna, wanna think about this for a minute. Um, in Psalm 2.9 and Revelation 2.27, we have the, let me read it so I don't mess it up, but Psalm 2.9, it says, uh, you shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Um, a, a rod of iron, you know, it, it, it's used metaphorically to indicate like a, a really strong civil law, a rod of iron, you know? And the, and the clay, uh, if you were to read Isaiah 64, 8 or Jeremiah 18, uh, has to do with, you know, the passage about uh, we are the, uh, you are the potter, we are the clay. Uh, the potter is the Lord, we, we the people of God are the clay that he's molding and shaping. So the clay represents God's people that are being molded into the image of God. But, but you have the, the feet over here uh, characterized by characterized by iron, which is strong civil law, and clay, which is God's people, you know, trying to conform to the image of God and trying to, you know, be, be godly people. So, so with that, verses 41 to 43, let me go back over here. Let me read 41, 42, and 43. Okay. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, <laughs> Linda, it's not, not a problem. We're in chapter two, and uh, we are right now in verse 41. So Daniel 2, verse 41. Oh, I'm glad you asked because, you, you know, you would have felt lost if you didn't know where we were. So Daniel 2, 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, okay, which of course are connected to the legs, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Ah, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Strong and fragile at the same time. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. So verses 41, 42, 43 are a little like a little sub 
piece of the Roman Empire that doesn't really gel together. They're like, they're there, they're strong, but they're fragile. They're, they have a strong civil code, but they're trying to be godly. And, and it's a unique situation. Uh, so let's try to decipher uh, what all of that means. Okay, so we have, we have the Babylonian, right? We have the we have the Medo-Persian Empire, we have the Grecian Empire, we have the Roman Empire, and then we have down at the bottom, iron and clay. That represents a portion of, not a portion, uh, the, a remnant of the Roman Empire, which would be modern-day Europe, Okay, which was a part of the Roman Empire. When you think of Rome, uh, of course, it's right there in the middle. But anyway, uh, the Roman Empire. So now I, I was thinking about, I, several thoughts came to my mind. Because we have all these kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, the Roman, and the European area. And I thought, what about Russia? What about China? What about Africa? What about South America? And then I realized in Daniel 7, where he has another, where Daniel has a dream of the four beasts, some of those kingdoms that I just mentioned are included in that vision, We'll get to that later down the road. And um, what about America? You know, where does America fit into this? And, and some of it, uh, we just have to kind of see where we are in history to see how these other nations of the world or even continents of the world fit into this thing. But anyway, did you know that currently the Roman Empire has 27 countries in it? Man, I would have never known that unless I studied it today. I want to read this to you because I because this is the, the feet and the clay represent the European world, uh, but these are the present day countries in in Europe, in alphabetical order. Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Latvia. Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malta, Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Sweden, and United Kingdom. All that's Europe. And if you think about it, uh, all those nations in Europe are, are, are civilly governed, you know, have a strong civil code. Most of those countries have a Christian background. So there's the clay, you have the iron and the clay, a strong, they're uh, strong in government, uh, they're, they're strong in faith, and, and they mix together, uh, they're strong but they're fragile. Over the years, there's been a lot of conflict in Europe, there's been a lot of stuff going on and a lot of different things happening. But anyway, let me, let me give you um, some time frames here, okay? So the Babylonian Empire, I'm going to write it down so you can look at it on my, on my famous artwork. But that was 605 B.C. to uh, 539. Okay, so if you're making a time frame, well, you know I love time frames. We'll goof that up. Well, let's say, okay, this is the, this is the, uh, right over here. The Babylonian Empire, 605 to 539 BC. All right? I should have done that better. Okay. I'll write down Babylonian So, yeah, how's that? <laughs> okay, so you got from there to there, the Babylonian Empire. Okay, then, then the next one is the, the uh, Medo-Persian Empire. Goes from 539... To 331. So now you have that. 
See, we're going, we're going this way. We're going towards Jesus, right? You've got the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, then you have the Grecian Empire. which is uh, 331 to 168. And then you have the Roman Empire, which is 168 to 476 AD. You see that? All right, so you have the Babylonian, then the Medo-Persian, then the Grecian, and then the Roman Empire. Of course, Jesus was born in, when the, in the Roman Empire. And then you have, you have the splintering effect of the, Rome, of the Roman Empire, which, which is 476 to the present, which is, you know, some type of conglomeration which ended up being Europe. So when, when, when the Roman Empire fell in 476 or the, nor the northern tribes from, you know, those uh, from Denmark, the Viking people, all those, all those people, they were tribal, but they came all over the Roman Empire, including England and Ireland and uh, all through the, the mainland of what we now know as Europe, but they came and settled there and eventually came the various countries and nations of Europe, which I just named. Uh, they're all descendants of all those, not only northern tribes, but people from the south probably came up as well. Uh, so anyway, so that's the time frame. Let me, let me say it again. You have the Babylonian Empire, 605 to 539. The Medo-Persian Empire, 539 to 331. You have the Grecian Empire, 331 to 168, and the Roman Empire from 168 to 476 AD. And then you have the European Empire de developing from the first century all the way till today, and to what it is today is the European common market. So all, all that's pretty interesting to me. Uh, now, what we didn't talk about, what, how are we doing for time? Well, we've got about 10 minutes. Uh, hey, it's Samar. Where is it, Samar? Oh yeah, how you doing, it's Samar? Good to see you. God bless you. Welcome to our Wednesday night in the Word. Uh, Twenty six in attendance. I had my eye off of this for a while. Okay, very good. Uh, all right. So anyway, uh, got my papers and my notes. Hope this was helpful. Uh, I should write it on here. Actually, I'm going to do that real quick. Medo Persian is 539 to 331 BC. Grecian Empire, 331 to 168. Roman Empire, 168 to 476 AD. And then the iron and the clay would be 476 to the present. How's that? Now that is fine artwork in my book, church. Let me just tell you. Fine, fine artwork. Artwork. Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecian, Roman, gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron and clay. You have the time frame up there. So, you know, working on a timeline, going from over here, from over here, going that way, uh, you know, this is BC. This is when Jesus was born. Now we switch over to AD. And, and we're over here now. We're way at the end. So you have 2021 over there. So, I mean, on all those 2,000, or let's see, oh, that would be what, 1,500 years, a lot has happened in Europe, <laughs> you know, but the, the nations have developed. But what we didn't talk about, and we have to do this before we sign off tonight is uh verses 44 and 45 because we didn't talk about the stone see that stone on the ground verse 44 and 45 and, and in and in the day 
And in the days of these kings, okay, these kings over these over the you know the iron and clay area because that was the last one mentioned uh the god of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people like the other ones notice okay this is important too when 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 nebuchadnezzar was here he was overcome by the Medo persian empire but they swallowed up the babylonian empire so they, they kind of incorporated it. The Grecian Empire then swallowed up the, the Medo Persian and Babylonian. They had it all. The Romans, they took the whole shooting match, and the Roman Empire was very diverse and very cultured. And uh, let's see, I had something written down here. I thought that was kind of important. Um, uh, yeah, we, have, we get like philosophy. We get civil rule. We get the the Greek. Uh, the, the Greeks were philosophical. The Medo Persians were like uh, they had, they had a, a strong ethic code. The Babylonians had the astrology. All that stuff was incorporated into the Roman Empire. Even today, right now, we we have incorporated all of these different cultures into the Western world. Actually, the Eastern world has it too, to some degree, because the Babylonian Babylonian Empire was in the now Middle East. Um, all right, so anyway, the stone. Okay, so the stone is going to be, so the stone will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed like all of these were destroyed. Okay, so here, here's the thing. This whole figure of the man like that represents humanity. It represents the world order. It represents the world system. It represents the value of the world. Man trying to do his best to make things happen. But when the stone comes, he crushes everything. He destroys the feet, the legs, the belly, the chest, and the head. He destroys everything, wipes it out, and the stone grows and grows and grows and grows and takes over the whole world. The stone represents... The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The stone represents the kingdom of God. Absolutely. And so this is, let's see. <laughs> so, okay. Verse uh, 45. Uh, 44. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It'll break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And as much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Now, what, what Daniel's saying is there is coming a kingdom that will wipe out the European kingdoms, the Roman Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire. And this new kingdom that is coming is going to come small, but it's going to destroy everything and take over the whole earth. So in a nutshell, and i got to wrap it up, but when John the Baptist said, Behold, the kingdom of God is coming, Prepare, get ready, repent, get ready. And then when Jesus came on the scene, he began to preach the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God began in Jesus' ministry as a little tiny stone. And little by little, it's growing, growing, growing. It's getting bigger and it's growing stronger. But the, the kingdom of God will never be in all of its fruition until all the kingdoms of the world pass away. And all the kingdoms of the world won't pass away until there's the rapture. Boom, we're out of here. There's a seven-year tribulation. And then at the end of that seven years, Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. And after the thousand years, Satan's released for a little bit of time. But then comes the final judgment. After that final judgment will be the new heaven and the new earth. Because this whole worldly system at that time 
will be totally wiped out and destroyed, and the kingdom of God will then take over the whole world. Isn't that awesome to think about it? And all that came from, from Daniel's interpretation and Daniel's uh, yeah, interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So praise the Lord. Uh, God is good. God is good. Listen, I'm going to give you a minute to write a comment if you can. I've got to take care. I've got to get something really quick. I'll be right back. Praise the Lord. All right, who's got a comment for me? Oh, I see a lot of things right here. All right. <laughs> Edna, yeah, put on a poster board. All right. Hey, Malada, good to see you here. Rapture, boom, we're out. Okay. All right, so everyone got that? All right, so very good. Uh, one more time. Da -da -da -da. And uh, the timeline. <laughs> okay, everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I, I, I'm going to wait here in the office for a few minutes to see if there's any questions. Or, Hey, Johnny Brenz, good to see you here, too. Uh, I think I saw everyone that signed on. I, if I missed you, sorry. But... Um... <laughs> Yeah, so we had quite a few people on here. Anyway, um, I'm going to be in the office for a little bit, uh, writing little comments. If you have any questions, if I wasn't clear on something, please let me know. And uh, thank you for your attention to this, uh, this teaching tonight. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's a bar. I was doing my best to follow. I was caring for Carmen at the same time. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. Uh, it's a bar. You know, you do the best you can. Uh, I think believe this is, is being recorded, so it will be saved on the New Life Haverhill page. If you want to go back and check it out later, you could. Um, all right, I'm going to pray and sign out of here and uh, give you all uh, the rest of the night to do whatever you have to do. Okay, dear Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this message. Thank you for your word. Uh, we give you praise and glory. And Lord God, help us to continue to understand your word and to apply your word to our lives. And so we thank you for the, uh, the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, for the interpretation. Help us, Lord, to take that knowledge that we have and apply it to our lives. Because as we read in 1 John, whoever has this hope in them that Christ is coming purifies himself just as he is pure. Help us, Lord, to live, live ready for your return. And so we thank you and we praise you for it. So thank you, Lord, and God bless everyone on here, every family represented. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, how many hearts and likes? Okay, we have 1,060, 1,070, <laughs> it keeps going up, 1,081 thumbs up, 2,808 hearts, 11 Faces with tears, and one with a, one with a happy <laughs> eleven with happy tears, one with sad tears. Okay, all right. God bless you. I'll uh, I'll write back in comments in just a minute. Have a great night. Men's Zoom tomorrow. Men's breakfast Saturday. Sunday morning is Halloween day for the world. For us, we're celebrating the victory of Jesus over the devil, his victory on the cross, and his victory over the empty grave. Come and have communion with us if you can. God bless you. See you soon. Bye.